thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no hollow heart, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul. Whatever thou be, until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hello, Dan. I'm Lindsay. Hello, Lindsay. Hello. Lindsay has one very quick scholarship reminder, and then we are into today's horror. Yes. So in case you have not applied for the Cummins Family Scholarship and you would like to, you have until April 24th, and that is the day that applications are due. None will be accepted late. And for all the information that you might need about that, you can simply go to badmagicproductions.com, click the Cummins Scholarship banner at the top, and off you go. It's very easy from there. Off you go. <laughs> and how many uh, how many fans submitted supposedly true horror stories do you have for us today? 8,000. 8,000. 8,000. We're going to be here for a while. <laughs> um, no, I have two per huge. My first tale is a, a story that we all can relate to, a rental house mm. that is not quite right. Do we have a doppelganger? Do we have a mimic? Is it just a haunted house? Fun. It's really, really great. And then my second story is... Um, it's two tales, not related, but I felt the need to share both of them just to yeah. kind of like share this family's uh, interactions with the other side. Their first story is actually ma- will make you giggle. Like it's a pretty silly story. And then the second tale, extremely dark demonic possession. Wow. Okay. It, I mean, that's my takeaway. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, I also have two. My first uh, in like a true two, no second part. Um, I have uh, one set in Alabama that centers around a ghost that has been spotted by numerous truckers and some other drivers as well uh, while driving at night along Highway 5. Lore and real nice creepy modern encounter claim for this one. Then we're going to head to Pune, India, and explore the story of the Pune poltergeist. Okay. A lot of poltergeist activity was claimed to center around two boys adopted by the same family, and they are brothers, uh, between 1927 and 1929. Very aggressive poltergeist activity. Okay. So once you showcase your spoopy socks, uh, we're off and running. I have two things to show. I forgot to tell you before we started. Oh, man. I know. I'm sorry. I don't know how much zoomy zoomy we can do. Oh, those are very cool. But le- um, yes, these, uh, they're, well, maybe we can take a picture of them and throw them up on socials. <laughs> uh, but they're very cute. They're round little disc earrings that say spoopy bitch. Yeah. And they came from fan Samantha, who is just taking a little sabbatical right now. And this is like a stress reliever. So Aww. they're not for sale. She was just making them. They made her happy. She thought they'd make me happy, which they do. Well, that was nice, Samantha. I know. Thanks, Sam. And these are my socks. These lovely Fair Isle socks. I don't take all the socks home, but sometimes I do. And these ones are not going to get donated to any charities. These ones are coming home with me. Yeah, those I are fun. I love them. They're super cozy. Yeah, they look very comfy. Yeah, I like them. And they match my outfit today. <laughs> Go. Uh, okay, so here we go. Uh, Alabama State Route. Uh, and actually, before I set it up, uh, before I set it up, uh, a little bit of backstory, some brief online encounter claims, and then a juicy uh, modern encounter claim. Alabama State Route Five, also known as Highway Five, is a 198 mile long road that runs through the western part of the state. It is not uncommon to see truckers cruising along this highway. It would actually be uncommon not to see them, actually. Uh, and some of these truckers have reported terrifying encounters with a spirit that has supposedly haunted this road for years. According to local lore, decades ago, a teen girl was coming home from prom with her boyfriend. The young couple was driving down Highway 5 when they got into an argument that ended with the girl getting out of her boyfriend's truck and starting to walk home. But she never made it. Her dead body was found in a shallow ditch on the side of the road the very next morning. She had been hit by a large truck and the driver had fled the scene. Ever since... There have been reports of a teen girl's apparition appearing at different points on the highway, mainly between Natural Bridge and Jasper. Truckers driving down Highway 5 on rainy nights have claimed that they've seen the teen girl's apparition climbing into the passenger seat, uh, or excuse me, climbing onto the passenger side of their truck and peeking into the window as they drive down the road. The leading theory as to why the apparition would do this is that she is looking for the man who killed her. While non-trucker motorists have also reportedly spotted a ghostly teen girl walking along the side of Highway 5, it doesn't seem as if she's ever tried to get inside any of their vehicles. 
Some truckers have been so spooked by this entity that they try their best to bypass Highway 5 altogether, on the off chance that they might see the spirit again. Several drivers have shared their experiences with this spirit on paranormal websites. In 2022, an individual named Bernie commented on the website Haunted Places. I installed cancer treatment equipment and happened to be traveling Highway 5 just before midnight on Friday this past fall. Had never heard about this girl or the road being haunted. I was driving and my helper had just put his phone down so he could get a little rest. Thankfully, it wasn't a full minute after putting his phone down when we see a lady in the left lane facing to the right but not moving. We both freak out. I slowed down a little but my passenger said, no way, keep going. I asked if he noticed whether or not he was able to see her face. He tells me, she doesn't have a face, bro. I didn't want to say it because I wasn't sure if I just didn't notice it, but I thought she did have a face. Maybe we just couldn't see it, but I plainly remember her looking almost pixelated, like it was a hologram or something. We'll never forget it and was glad to not be the only one to see it. He would have told me I was crazy had he been asleep. Another commenter by the name of Shane wrote, I remember when I was a small child riding with my mom and dad on a trip while I was out of school. I've looked for this place a lot since I've gotten older. My dad has passed on now and my mom never knew the location. We were traveling through Alabama late one night. It was nasty, raining, and foggy. The highway was narrow. We could see something up ahead because it was almost glowing. When we got to it, it was a woman in a long snow white dress that reached to the ground. It was raining and muddy, but she was so clean. She was standing on the edge of the road, like on the white line. She never did anything, just stood there. Never could see her in the side mirrors of the truck, a memory I will never forget. Finally, another anonymous user claiming to be a trucker shared his story online in hopes that he could prevent a deadly accident. The following is a story of his encounter with the spirit of Highway 5. Time now for the tale of Stuck in a Hit and Run. The longest nights are the ones when I have too much time to think. Instead of needing to stay alert and focus on the cars around me due to some fellow late night travelers, some of them weaving in and out of traffic and nearly causing accidents, I instead find myself blankly staring ahead out at a rural highway where I may not see another driver for most of the night. I've always preferred city routes over rural ones. I find the country to be eerie in the dark in addition to being lonely, and that was especially true on the night I drove down State Route 5 near Jasper, Alabama. It was another one of those nights where I had too much time to think. My thoughts centered around my family, who were states away. I'd already passed through miles of farmland between tiny towns, all of which were completely dead in the middle of the night. I was new to the industry at this time, just a few months out from finishing my training program and getting my commercial driver's license. I was happy with the money, more than I'd got by quite a bit in my old job. My earnings were more than decent, but I was also away from home more than I wanted to be. I had a wife and a little girl I was leaving behind. She didn't like that I was gone so much, especially now that we had a toddler running around everywhere. My wife and I had gotten into a fight before I left on that trip. She told me she wasn't sure this career was right for our family, and I reminded her how we were able to pay for more things now that my salary had increased. She said she worried about me getting into an accident and dying, and that she'd rather have me home and alive over any amount of money. Things were tense when I pulled out of the driveway. I reflected on our last conversation a lot while I drove that night. At some point, I considered calling her, but by that time, it was already almost 1 a.m. where I was, and she was an hour ahead on Eastern time. I knew she'd be asleep, and I didn't want to wake her up and possibly make things worse. I focused on my GPS instead. I had a couple more hours before I could stop and get a few hours of sleep before the next leg of my trip. I wondered how much longer I'd have to stare at this dark, lonely stretch of highway, two lanes, not a soul in sight. And then I saw movement in my periphery. My eyes shifted to the right, and then, shit, I screamed. I felt my entire body jerk back as far as it could go into the cab. I was so frightened that before I knew what I was doing, I jerked the wheel sharply to the left, and once I did, it was too late. I could do nothing as the truck veered into the other lane, then onto the grass, then down a gently sloping embankment and into the thick woods where I crashed into a tree. My body went forward and to the side until my seatbelt cut into me. My head slammed into the window. Sharp pain coursed through my entire body. Before I passed out, my head ended up turning towards the passenger side window. I could still see her, a pale face with searching eyes peeking through the window, and then my vision went black. I'm not sure how much time passed before I woke up. In my delirious, injured state, I had the strangest dream. It started off as a repeat of what I'd been doing just before the crash. I was driving down a highway that looked eerily similar to Highway 5, 
but the hands on the steering wheel were not my own. They were a man's hands, but he had a tan and was wearing a long sleeve plaid shirt. I couldn't see his face, but I was sure it wasn't me. It was like I was watching the world through his eyes. It was dark and foggy. Visibility was low, and this driver that I was inside of somehow couldn't see more than a few feet ahead of them. He didn't have time to stop when a girl ran into the road, waving her arms frantically like she needed help. He slammed on the brakes, but his truck still hit her at almost full speed. I felt and heard a sickening thump as he ran her over. After a few agonizing seconds, the truck came to a full stop. The driver sat there for a long time, breathing hard, heart racing, hands shaking. I guess that his expression was one of complete horror. This was a trucker's worst nightmare come to life. I didn't know how much time passed, but eventually the driver unbuckled himself, opened the door, and stepped into the road. He was still shaking as he got on his knees and looked under the truck. It only lasted for a moment, but what I saw was terrible. The girl didn't look like a person anymore. If I hadn't seen her before, I probably wouldn't have even known she was a girl, were it not for the fancy dress she was wearing and her long hair. Her body was almost unrecognizable, so mangled and bloody. The driver crawled out from under the truck, stood up and stumbled to the other side of the road where he promptly vomited into the grass. He stood there with his hands on his knees and stared at the ground for a while. I watched as he turned around and went back to his truck. He crawled back underneath and began dragging the girl out. I didn't want to watch, but I had no choice. I couldn't wake up from this horrible dream. I thought he was going to look for her ID or perhaps go back into the truck to radio for help. Instead, he carried her mangled body to the other side of the road, walked into the woods, and gently laid her down in a ditch. I'm sorry. I heard him sob as he turned around, ran back to his truck, and sped off into the dark night. Before I could process what just happened, the dream shifted. Now I was back in my truck. I got the sense that I was back in my own body, too, and this was confirmed when I held up my hands and looked at them. Then I heard a rustling next to me. The girl was back, and my mind was flooded with memories of what I saw before the crash. I was driving on the highway again, right before I drove off the road. I heard something smack against my passenger side window. I was expecting a bird, tree branch, hail, anything but what I actually saw. I saw a girl's face pressed against the glass, peering in at me with wide, curious eyes. That was what, went, that was what made me crash. Then it felt like I was awake again. I wasn't, but it felt that way. She was sitting right next to me in that wrecked cab. She was the girl from my dream, the girl who was hit by the trucker. I recognized her face from the moment she jumped in front of the truck. She was even wearing the same dress. I was thankful that I was seeing this version of her and not the one after the accident. She looked like some teenage girl going to prom with a formal dress and her hair and makeup all done up, but she didn't seem happy. She appeared anxious, upset about something. We stared at each other for a long time before she broke the silence, asking in a voice barely above a whisper, do you know who killed me? I wanted to answer her. I really did. I tried to remember my first dream, but the details were rapidly slipping out of my mind, as most dreams do. I tried to recall any identifying details about the man or his truck. I wanted to ease her pain somehow, now that I knew how she died. I was speechless. I shook my head at her, internally pleading with her to understand, to forgive me for not being able to help her. She smiled sadly, and then she said, It's time to wake up. And I did. My eyes opened and I felt myself being pulled out of the driver's seat uh, by someone's hands. I was looking up at the night sky and then my view was obscured by a man's face. He's awake! Sir, the man said, can you speak? We're going to take you to the hospital right now. Try and talk to me if you can. I, I started. My throat was so dry. It was a struggle to tr talk, but I managed to say in a hoarse voice, I crashed. I realized I was on a stretcher being pushed into an ambulance. My neck was already in a brace and I couldn't move my head. The two EMTs were assessing me while the ambulance then sped down the road. We arrived at the hospital after what felt like an eternity. By then, I was slightly more coherent. My injuries weren't severe, thankfully. I was diagnosed with a minor concussion and a couple broken ribs. I hadn't seen what state my cab was in. An officer was waiting for me once I was stabilized and taken to a bed. I was drug tested and questioned repeatedly about the circumstances leading up to the crash. I knew, that if I, was I knew that I was completely sober when it happened, but if I told the truth that I saw a girl's face outside my truck, I could potentially face serious charges that would cost me my job. I had to make up a lie on the spot. The best thing I could come up with was that a deer ran out in front of me, scared me, and out of instinct, I swerved to avoid hitting it. Happens all the time. I learned that a passerby saw me and called the police. That was at 1.15 a.m. When I checked the clock a few minutes before the crash, it was around 1.00. 
so I had lost consciousness for several minutes. The worst part of the night was when my employer called my wife, who was really worried about me and very upset that she couldn't come see me in the hospital. She was also furious, told me I needed to quit. I stayed overnight and was released the next day. I was declared at fault for the crash because I swerved instead of hitting the make-believe deer, which caused the accident. I got a couple points on my commercial license and a write-up at work, but I didn't lose my job. I returned to work after a few days off. My wife didn't like it, but also we needed the money. Within weeks, I was back in Alabama. This time, I did my research and planned a route that would ensure I avoided as much of Highway 5 as possible. I never told my wife what I saw, but I decided I needed to write about this to warn others about the dangers in this area. I don't want anyone else, trucker or not, to be killed in an accident if they can avoid it. I know what I saw that night, but I'm not sure if the dream had any meaning. I wondered if it was a message, if the girl's appearance was her way of pleading for help. I know I won't be able to help her find the answer she was seeking. I hope someone else can. All I can do is pray that her soul finds peace, and I've done that every single night since that happened. Man. Yeah. There's so many things. First of all, that's terrifying. Just the thought of driving and then just uh-huh. like a face popping Oof. up. And like, because I was thinking driving at night already freaks me out. And the older I get, not that like I'm so old, but <laughs> with like each passing year, it yeah. is harder and harder to see at night. Mm-hmm. It's, like, a, it's a real thing. It is a real thing. Like when I saw my ophthalmologist this yeah. year, uh, he was like, yeah, I mean, so like increased my contacts and glasses a little bit to like help combat that but it just is what it is Mm -hmm. so just that thought of like already being afraid of driving in the dark to begin with at any age and then adding now like as you're getting older and your vision isn't the same and then for me like if i'm on a long dark stretch of road i just you know this about me anyways i just get sleepy it doesn't Mm -hmm. matter how much coffee like i i could never be a long haul truck driver because i would just be like yeah. I mean, I have that problem in our tiny little town. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so just then like I put all those things together and then the stress of the fight with his wife and just, yeah. oh, it's just a bad situation. Yeah, I can see myself in that story too. It's like, I actually can drive for long distances. Yeah, you had to. Yeah, had to. But um, but I, but I do zone out. Like like if it's a, if there's not a lot of cars around, uh-huh. so I'm not worried about, you know, traffic or, you know, causing an accident with another vehicle and it's a long drive, I definitely zone out. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I'm half there and paying attention to the road, but I'm also some other place in my head, just a daydream. That's just, that's your general state anyway. <laughs> yeah, true, true. And then, and then if some, but yeah, if some face like snap me out of that, I could absolutely see myself jerking just on, on instinct or yep. reflex or whatever, just jerking the steering wheel or, and then with those big trucks and the momentum they have, Oh yeah. like once they've turned at a certain speed to a certain degree, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's any fixing it. I don't think you can, you know, crank it back around like you could in a car, perhaps. No, no, I don't yeah. think so. And I didn't know, it's just like an interesting random detail, that you're encouraged to hit the deer instead of swerving. I mean, it makes sense. I've heard now, that growing now, up. Well, I didn't grow up in like yeah. a, you know, I grew up in a city, yeah. you know, where it's like, not that we didn't have like big trucks, but we didn't have these, the kind of like stretches of freeway yeah. that like you grew up, you know, like people coming through Riggins from yep. like McCall, you know, like just a very different thing. But I'm like, oh, like my, even just in regular driving, no one ever told me like, just hit the deer. Yeah. If you have your seatbelt on, I mean, that's the big thing. If you don't have your seatbelt on hitting a deer could be fatal for you. Yeah. But if you do have your seatbelt on, I mean, it would be such a freak thing for, for you to be, uh, killed, you know, in a situation like that. Mm. I mean, you know, deer, you know, good size. Obviously, I guess if you're driving like a teeny, teeny, tiny car, I've heard, I've heard stories of like little tiny sports car, real low to the ground in front theoretically it could like send the deer into your windshield oh my god you know like the body and then yes theoretically but even then i think your odds are better just to hit it and take your chances at a, at a highway speed yeah yeah rather than swerving because then you know like right embankments other embankments, cars a river you know canyon next to the road like who knows i mean growing up where i did because of the river and just the canyon we were told like just hit it because that makes sense. There's no room to go off the road. No, there is not. Yep. You're either smashing into the side of a mountain or you're going off a cliff. Yep, you're going off a cliff into a cold, raging river. Like you're gonna die either way. Oh my god. Yeah. Oh god. Okay. Was well, so it was very fascinating? And also, just like as a random side note, uh, just like big thanks to truckers because it is such yes. a dangerous job. And it I think really we all, is. I think we all take for granted that we could just go on Amazon right now and you can choose like. I I consciously choose the like longest shipping time that I can like in my life Uh because I'm like, when you choose like overnight next day, I'm like, who's that affecting? How is, how is this thing getting Uh here in one day? 
Like, it just doesn't seem feasible to me. So I'm very conscientious of it and just very grateful for people who, yeah. who risk their lives in this way so that, I don't know, I can get a new pair of jeans <laughs> yeah, overnight. Yeah. Like, that's insane. I know. I think about it with those those trucks. I mean, there is so much responsibility, like the braking times and everything. Oh God, is, it's is, too is, much. It's going to be so different. Your reaction time, you don't get the same amount. And I just think about, like, just the fact of having to fight boredom off. Oh, so many hours throughout the day, you know, because it's like, yeah, things can be going smooth for a thousand hours in a row. Yep. And, and then, then all of a sudden out of nowhere and, you know, some something, you know, jumps into the middle of the road and you have to be ready for that. Like you have to just maintain a certain level of alertness Yeah. to be safe and do that for a long time. Yeah. Just it's, it is impressive. Pictures? Yes. Uh, this one, this first one is pick of highway five during the day. Okay. Just uh, like a just regular old highway. Yeah. Nothing. Just any old stretch of highway. And then this cracked me up. This this next one, this is a picture posted on Reddit by someone claiming that they took this picture at night along Highway 5. But it doesn't look like the same highway for starters. Right. Uh, I guess it could be a different stretch or like a, it looks stretch. like it could be an on ramp because you see those um, arrow signs. Oh, yeah. Or just a tight the turn. Rail. Uh, yeah. It doesn't, okay. look, it doesn't look like a highway to me. It's too narrow. Uh, it looks like a, a residential street. Well, yeah, I was going to say like more than anything. Although I will say where my dad lives. <laughs> yeah. When you think about my dad's house, his backyard butts up to a yes. freeway. And it does look like that. The city a put highway, in yeah. uh, a highway. The city put in um, those. What you see are like a, a fence. They're like sound. It's, it's a sound barrier. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. So up I guess. I yeah. guess, but it doesn't seem right. <laughs> Not when you compare that to the first photo. Yeah, and, and it just feels, <laughs> it feels very, very, very Photoshopped. It feels, I was going to say it feels very, very staged. Uh -huh. She also doesn't have feet. I know. Feel, that feels like a weird Photoshop. Like they put their friend out there and then Photoshopped her feet out afterwards. Uh, that led me into some more of these type of photos. <laughs> okay. This next one's a uh, uh, badly Photoshopped picture of a supposed girl's ghost on a different highway at night or kind of like a road. And, if you, and Logan, if you can zoom in on her face... Okay, then it's just a picture of like a girl with um, two like, what, pigtails? Is yep, that what they're called? They're right. braided that way. And then they just took like some weird face from a monster and just kind of slapped it on her face. And, yeah, yeah. and, it, and it doesn't even quite fit like no, when it's zoomed it doesn't. in. And the Kills face me. color and the neck color are different. Yep. It's like kind of like almost like a Phantom of the Opera mask. It's, it's a bad Photoshop. And then this next one's my favorite. This is the worst one yet. I like that this girl is wearing a wedding dress. But mm -hmm. also has like Chuck Taylors or some equivalent type shoe on. Like it's a, uh, and then they just use some opaqueness filter uh -huh. to make her a little bit translucent. And she's definitely in Italy. You can tell by that house. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sarcastic. <laughs> oh, yeah, she is wearing just like, I mean, that just looks like uh, uh, a Halloween costume. Yeah. AI, I will say, <laughs> is making a lot of horror pictures. I mean, obviously they're not real, but like, yeah. It's it's really good, really cool. I think for like more scary type horror photos, where like you can put in any kind of monster now, and there'll be some AI generated images. Yeah, and they do look better than that. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember when? Uh, Thanks, Logan. Do you remember when? This is related, but not Photoshop. Uh, we had convinced our kids that Dan's mom um, performed in a oh, yeah. all female traditional Japanese drumming. <laughs> It was like at the end of some movie we watched uh -huh. with the kids and there was like a scene of traditional uh -huh. Japanese drumming and then we were like, and your mom was there and she was like, oh yeah, no, I did that. I did that. And the kids, we really had them going. Yeah, they were like the right age. They were oh, like, I don't God, know, five, so five, five and seven, maybe somewhere yeah, around five there. Five and seven, six and eight, something like that. Just yeah. like, but like old enough to know what Photoshop was because then like three months later. Or I, I think it was even longer than that. We kept it going for a while. Well, okay. Well, however long it was yeah. later, I don't know yeah. if that's relevant, yeah, yeah. but we were at your mom's house and we had photoshopped your mom's face onto like one of them yeah I, and showed, I, did, I did it quickly showed them a picture and kyler goes that is terrible photoshopping and then <laughs> yep. then it was up then it was yep i ruined it <sighs> all right uh, well, that, that was we just had a recent uh trucker story as well about that weird deer thing oh yeah the roadkill yeah. story yeah yeah, mm -hmm. oh, yeah so, really gory one into it uh you ready to get up uh, ready to uh get up into some pune and head to, head to india sure Sweet, sweet Pune. During the early- They don't appreciate that. Who doesn't? The people of Pune. Oh, they don't? No. Uh, do we have a strong listener base in Pune? We do. I bet they do appreciate it. I don't think they do. I'm saying it correctly. Uh, during the early 20th century, Pune, like the rest of India, fell under British rule. Known as the Oxford of the East, Pune would boast over 100 institutes of higher learning, including several prestigious universities. 
Say it right. Prestigious. Intellectuals from all over the world moved to the city. This is what brought Miss Cone to India, who moved to the city with her sister when her sister married a doctor and historian by the name of S.V. Ketker. Miss Cone, an intellectual herself, took a job as a European language teacher at a university and lived in a house with her sister and the doctor, now her brother-in-law. Soon thereafter, Dr. Ketker and Mrs. Ketker adopted a four-year-old boy named Damador, a happy and intelligent child, and the small family lived happily together until they found themselves in the midst of one of the most sinister and dangerous poltergeist cases ever recorded. The terrible events began in 1927, and this, and then Miss Cone would record all the happenings in a journal, as they had now uh, the activity had now escalated between July of 1928 and July of 1929. Time now for the tale of the Pune poltergeist. The story begins when Damodar's oldest brother, or older brother, excuse me, Ram, Ram Krishna Bapat, makes contact with the family in an attempt to reunite with his sibling. Dr. Ketker found 15-year-old Ram Krishna to be overworked, exploited, neglected, and malnourished in a tea shop in Mumbai. He arranged for the boy to be taken into the care of a clerk friend of his, while he also paid for him to attend school. And Ram Krishna excelled at school. He thrived once he'd been saved from such a miserable fate. And he lived happily in his new home for around a year. But at the very beginning of his second year at school, strange things began to happen. Very strange. On his first day back to school, Ram Krishna was walking along with his satchel when he claimed he felt himself transported to Victoria Garden, a housing project across Pune, satchel and all. And that was why he'd arrived to school so late that day. At first, the family didn't take the boy's story very seriously, not whatsoever. They dismissed it as many would as a child's imaginative way of trying to get out of trouble or of attempting to get some extra attention by telling a fantastical tale. But then he made more strange claims when more strange things happened that others would now witness. Objects around the boy began to move around the clerk's home on their own accord, and after witnessing this on multiple occasions, the clerk told Dr. Ketker that he was no longer willing to provide a home for the boy. Dr. Ketker now moved Ramkrishna into his home around the same time that he and Mrs. Ketker welcomed the arrival of a new baby girl into their family. Immediately, objects in the home began to go missing or turn up in strange locations. Ms. Cohn and her sister at first thought Ramkrishna must have been moving things around while he was asleep, sleepwalking, so they started taking turns and watching Ramkrishna during the night. And it didn't take long for the sisters to realize just how wrong they were. On the 27th of August, 1927, Miss Cone witnesses a large mirror, 16 feet long, gently detach itself from the wall. She watched in awe as a powerful and invisible force gently lifted the very heavy mirror off of the nail it had been hanging on and then placed it on the floor without damaging it. The whole time, Miss Cone stood watching the mirror in utter disbelief, and Ram Krishna slept deeply. And this ruled out the sleepwalking theory, at least in this instance. The next night, again, while Ram Krishna was sleeping, a paperweight was lifted off a table in the same gentle manner. At this point, though Miss Cone was understandably a bit shaken as she knew that whatever was occurring was indeed paranormal, she was not overly frightened as everything was so gentle and seemed so benign and harmless. But in time, as as the activity goes on, this feeling will change. Things escalated a few nights later when the whole household was woken by an extremely loud bang that was not only heard but felt. It shook the entire house. Running simultaneously to the source of the noise, the three adults living in the home were all stunned to find Ram Krishna's room in a state of chaos. Ram Krishna was on the floor, claiming he had been violently thrown from the heavy wooden trestle table which he had been sleeping on. The table was now moved to a 45 degree angle away from its original position. A heavy wooden chest had been moved to block a door at the other end of the room, and books were scattered everywhere. After that night, Ram Krishna refused to sleep on the table. He was too scared, and he would only sleep on the floor. By the latter part of 1927, after news had spread about the strange events in Dr. Ketker's family home, numerous people around the city were eager to help and offered to let Ram Krishna sleep over at their houses. Dr. Ketker and his wife took a few of these people up on their offers, but then time after time, These other families would change their minds as objects would fly around their homes. And other strange things would happen, like coins falling from thin air. Then at the start of 1928, the poltergeist activity seemed to change who it focused its energy upon. Whatever had been haunting Ram Krishna, the entity that had followed him all the way from Mumbai to Pune and followed him around wherever he went in Pune, now turned its attention to his brother Damodar. 
Things started off quite innocently. The family was having breakfast together when one of Damador's toys rolled across the veranda by itself and hit Miss Khan on the ankle. Soon, the activity again intensified. At the start of April, Damador and his mother were sitting playing a game when one of the boy's toys levitated into the air, then quickly flew across the room and into the next. A few days later was when the haunting finally began to take a sinister turn. Damador couldn't sleep one night due to his toys being noisily moved around his room consistently through the night. Then the following morning, when the young boy tried to eat, an invisible hand or some other force kept snatching his food away from him. Whenever he tried to drink, the hand or whatever it was would knock his glass to the ground, spilling, sometimes shattering it. His adoptive parents watched in horror, ho helpless to stop a force they couldn't see or touch. Eventually, Dr. Ketker began feeding 10-year-old, now 10-year-old Damador, on his lap. For whatever reason, the invisible entity would not touch him if he was with the doctor, but toys did still fly at the boy from other areas of the room, pelting him as he sat on his father's lap. As the days and weeks progressed, the abuse continued. Young Damador was pelted by objects being thrown at him from every direction. Soon, rumors began to spread in the community that the haunting was the reason the two boys had been orphaned in the first place. Hearing these rumors, Miss Cohn began to do some digging into the boy's family history. Indeed, the boy's mother had apparently been insistent that she had been seeing apparitions in the months leading up to her death. Following the sightings, she had become increasingly depressed, and she eventually ended her own life in just about the most painful way one can imagine. She set herself on fire. She drenched her sorry dress in kerosene and lit a match. And then Miss Cohn discovered more. Shortly before the mother's haunting began, she had not two, but three sons. Damodor and Ram Krishna had an older brother, and he had died at the age of nine. How he died is not mentioned. Miss Cohn now wondered, was it his spirit that first haunted his mother, then his brother Ram Krishna, and now Damodor? Then on August 12, 1928, Damodor's adopted mother saw two apparitions. Appearing together simultaneously, the outlines of two white figures emerged from the wall, moving towards Miss Cohn's bed as she slept. The woman looked on in horror as the figures moved towards where her sister was sleeping and began making movements as if they were about to climb into bed with her. Then, just as quickly as they had appeared, they were gone. Damador also started seeing apparitions around this time, describing a shadowy figure that would follow him, make horrible faces and grin devilishly, and laugh maniacally as the boy walked around during the day. Sometimes he said that the apparition would appear right next to him, whispering something sinister in his ear. The activity in the home was now growing steadily more malevolent. Glasses would be thrown across rooms and smash into walls. Liquids would bubble out and spill from their containers. Coins materialized and fell from seemingly nowhere. Later in the year, things started to get much worse for young Damador. The haunting got a lot more physical. He would now feel invisible hands pushing him around as he tried to move. The young boy fell into a depression, lethargic and refusing to eat. He was scared nearly all the time. One day, he had been playing outside when he ran into the house shaking and crying, nearly inconsolable, as he tried to explain to his adopted mom how he had felt himself lifted and carried through the air. He had been so frightened, he closed his eyes, and when he stopped moving, moving and opened them, he found himself sat in the front seat of the family car. That same evening, the boy became sick. He was pale, gaunt, and weak, his pulse almost gone. The family called for a doctor to come examine him. The only explanation that the doctor and many others could uh, offer was that the boy was exhausted. Other than the symptoms of fatigue he displayed, he seemed perfectly healthy. The family was desperate. They called around and spoke to clairvoyants and so-called ghost experts. One such man named Mr. V was convinced he could drive out the spirit, and he was invited over to the house to perform a cleansing or exorcism type ritual. But then halfway through chanting some kind of prayer, the man froze and stopped moving or speaking. He was entranced in this state for several moments. Then when he snapped out of it, he didn't feel well enough to continue. He tried once more a few days later, but now fell entirely unconscious for several minutes. He was only brought back from this state when Miss Cone and her sister poured water on him. Once he returned to his normal waking state of consciousness, he fled and would not return. By December of 1928, the paranormal situation in the doctor's home had grown more strange still and more violent. Food would be stolen from the cupboards and thrown around the house, not that different from previous activity. But now on occasion, the entity seemed to eat the food. There would be saliva-coated teeth marks and things, with chunks of food apparently missing. 
Gross. Then the biting moved to little Damador. He too would have saliva-covered teeth marks on his body, often in places he couldn't have reached himself, like his back. The family continued to consult anyone they thought could help them. They talked to everyone from witch doctors to Catholic clergymen. Several different sorts of exorcism attempts took place. None were successful. Then in April of 1929, events took their darkest turn yet, as the entity now began to target Damador's little sister, Mr. and Mrs. Ketker's daughter, who was just one year old. The little girl would be pinched, scratched by the sinister entity, entity, and then strangled. On April the 29th, the family were all having dinner together. The little girl was sitting at a table at the table in a type of high chair when the bib around her neck all of a sudden uh, started to tighten as if something invisible had grabbed the bib from the back and pulled it back against the little girl's neck tighter and tighter until she couldn't breathe. Fortunately, when the adults present screamed and shouted and raced to help the child, the bib fell loose and she could breathe once more. Soon after this incident, she would bleed after another attack. One day, the little girl's thumb was sliced open, again by something invisible. Within days of that attack, a rusty shaving razor flew through the air and sliced a nasty cut across Damador's leg. Miss Cohn continued to search for answers, looking for some way to end this madness. Now locals seemed to think that the spirit was Damador's, uh, of Damador's brother was not behind all of this. They wondered if it was his father instead. Neighbors speculated that Damador's long-dead father, who was rumored to have had many enemies, must have upset someone badly enough for them to have paid a sorcerer to conjure a spirit and curse the family line. Miss Cohn, meanwhile, searches further for a solution to this horrifying mystery, and during her research she stumbles across an article about a case in Romania where a little girl was haunted by a poltergeist. The similarities of her experiences with what Miss Cohn had witnessed were many, including spittle-covered bite marks. The article mentioned a British man named Harry Price, and Miss Cohn was able to track down his contact information. She called him, and Mr. Price was impressed with the detail in which Miss Cohn had documented the haunting, and after his meeting with her, he interviewed many other witnesses to the same phenomena. Soon, an invitation was extended for him to uh, travel to Damador, uh, or to, so, excuse me, travel to Damador, pick up Damador, and then bring him back to England to his laboratory of psychical research so the haunting could be studied. But unfortunately, that is where the story ends. His invitation was never responded to, and whatever happened next does not show up in historical records. We will never know if the activity stopped or if the activity continued to plague little Damador and those around him, possibly for the rest of his life. So the the doctor sent the invitation to the family and then the family never replied? Yeah, this researcher. Or not, the, not doctor, researcher. Mm -hmm, this yeah. researcher in England, like, interviewed people. Yeah. Sounds like, um, I'm guessing at that time, probably through the mail. It uh, doesn't uh, say exactly how. But interviewed these people and then sent an invitation of, like, yep, bring him to England or, you know, come get him, bring him to my lab. Uh, that, like, a society of psychical research. And then the family just never responded to the invitation. And we don't know if Damador is alive. Well, I mean, not, not now, but, like. Yeah, yeah, we don't know anything else. Yeah. I hate that. <laughs> yeah. It has me so crazy. Uh huh. Damn adore. Strange little story. Yeah, yeah. just uh, uh, more intense than some poltergeist stuff, like as far as the strangulation. Yeah. Uh, and then like the cuts, like things, you know, like a razor going through the air. I know, terrifying. Mm -hmm. Scratches, pinches, pushes. Uh, I, there's, I only have a few pictures. I just wanted to have one picture of uh, downtown Pune, over 7.1 million people. There's so many people in India. Yeah, ninth most populated city in India. And I don't remember ever hearing about it before the story. Yeah, me either. Massive, massive city. Uh, actually, one little article I said, I didn't look into it too heavily, said it's actually, it's near Mumbai, but it's actually now bigger than Mumbai. It's a little wow. metro area. Um, there are no pics associated yet with this, uh, with the old story I can find online. But here is a picture from the 1992 horror classic Poltergeist. Okay. This is poor Thank Dr. You. Marty Casey hallucinating peeling his own face off in the mirror. And random trivia, those hands? Yeah. Steven, Spiel, uh, Steven Spielberg's hands. Why? Uh, I didn't realize this. Uh, and, I, and I've watched this movie and had a whole like series of nightmares about it as a kid. But Steven Spielberg wrote Poltergeist. He did? Yep. And he produced it. He would have directed it, but he was directing E.T. at the same time. Wow. He's and, a busy guy. Yeah. And contractually wasn't allowed to direct anything else while that movie was still in production. Yeah. Like a non-compete. Okay. But why are those his hands? Um, just put them up through just the way that they did like the prop. It was yeah. like that guy is this other actor's body. Yeah. And then his hands just to like. I know, but have, why couldn't the actor just use his own hands? Uh, I, I don't know. Something about the angle of it uh, or something. I, th I thought yeah. maybe there was like something to it. Like, you know, Spielberg wanted like uh, just. I didn't go that deep with it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
I just, uh, yeah, I just, you just said that he was Spielberg's hands, and I thought that was interesting. That is funny. He's got big hands in comparison to that little face. <laughs> yeah, he does. Any more pictures? Nope, that's it. Man, I was just like very intense. Mm hmm. Uh, what would you do? I mean, how do you even, I mean, it sounds like they tried everything. Yeah, they had everybody over. I mean, yeah, I don't know what you, I don't know what you would do. I mean, especially at that point where they're all sitting around the table together. Oh my God, the bib thing. Uh-huh. Because then it's like, I mean, okay, if the activity is focused around these two boys, first one, then the other. Mm -hmm. I mean, sadly, it's like you'd have to, I think, to keep the baby safe. I'm just thinking like, if okay, if you had the means. Yeah. He's a doctor. I'm guessing, you know, maybe makes a pretty good, you know, living. Sure. Uh, would you try at least to take Damador, take him to some other place? Maybe have the doctor stay with him there for a while, or the mother, or Miss uh, Cohn, somebody, yeah. while then the little girl, the unnamed, you know, little sister remains in the home. And then see if, like, does anything happen in the home while he's gone again? And if things don't happen in the home, but they do happen with, uh, oh my gosh, Damador, uh -huh. uh, then I think you have to, like, keep them separated until you figure it out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was interesting how the village, like, kind of participated too yeah just the rumor mill yeah well yeah. no like they like let oh, him like, come let, yeah, yeah they, let his, like, they let his older brother come yeah stay it's like come yeah. stay with us i'm like that's crazy yeah ram krishna yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah okay well very interesting very very interesting do you have a layla i, I do, forgot I, to make sure I, you had one i have a traditional one. Oh, does she smell um my nose is a little bit my sinus has been a little bit plugged up lately oh yeah i'm sorry but i, I think so i think vaguely yeah. yeah just just a trace just a little bit Okay. All right. Well, let's uh, discover what goes on at a rental house, which is like just, oh God, because there's not a lot you can do. Uh-huh. Yeah. We've had some like Airbnb stories and maybe some rentals before. But like apartments too. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Just places that aren't yours. Yep. Yeah. My husband and I have always been in tune with otherworldly encounters, but never seek them out. Odd whisperings, things moving that you can't quite chalk up to logic odd footprints in the snow that are wearily out of place, but nothing stuck with us until we moved back to Florida. We're originally from Tennessee. We've lived here once before, and to make a long, complicated, COVID-laced story shorter, we decided it was better for us and our three rescue dogs to move back to Florida. My husband and I both work in healthcare and have rather specific jobs, so the timing of our move was rather unfortunate with the housing market. Our intention was to buy and definitely not rent because we wanted to stay in Florida permanently. I know what you're thinking. We're not a show about the scary costs of housing, but it's the house we ended up renting that started it all. Once we were outbid on several houses and our start dates at our new jobs were quickly approaching, we knew we were going to have to rent. And remember those three rescue dogs? Well, them coming along with us was a non-negotiable. Finding a rental that would allow all three dogs, one of which weighed 100 pounds, was not exactly easy. After searching and searching and lots of begging, we ended up with a four-bedroom, two-bath house off of a street that we were somewhat familiar with. We agreed to our lease having only seen pictures of the home. And I would normally never do that, but we were so crunched for time. It was only temporary, and we were hopeful we'd find a house to purchase rather quickly. Upon arrival, it wasn't so bad. Relatively clean, fresh paint, places to store all of our boxes. It would do. We did notice the lingering smell of smoke towards the back of the house. That stale smoke smell just got stronger and stronger as you neared the primary bedroom. Something was off. We just didn't know what. We opted to sleep in the spare bedroom at the opposite end of the house, far away from the smell and bad energy. This had been our only option, and we had to stick it out. One of our dogs, who we lovingly call Shithead, is an <laughs> Australian shepherd mix who loves to hear his own voice. He began growling and barking down the hall in the direction of the primary bedroom. We brushed him off, thinking he had just seen some squirrels or something of the like. Normally, all the dogs would sleep on the couch in the living room. A few weeks into it, Shithead started following us into our bedroom, <laughs> hunkering down and refusing to move. It was as if he wanted to be as far away from that smoky primary bedroom as possible. A few months go by, more of the same. He barks, acts odd, occasional weird noises, weird feelings in the house, but you just can't quite place anything, so you ignore it. My husband always goes to the gym before work. He'd already left the house and I was alone with the dogs. I had fallen back asleep, and in what I thought was my dreams, I heard a guitar. At first, I thought one of the dogs had bumped into my husband's acoustic guitar, but then chords started to form as if my husband was playing, except he'd already left. 
Then our bedroom door opened, and there he was, my husband, playing his guitar. It looked just like him, but it was definitely not him. I don't know how to explain it because anyone else on the planet would have thought it was him, but when you know someone that intimately, you know when something is off. The face, the eyes, the expression, even the chords on the guitar. I started to panic. I tried to reach for my phone to dial 911, but I kept hitting the wrong numbers. Panic awakens me, and I'm home alone. It must have been a dream, right? I'm totally shaken, but now I have to get ready for work. I tell my husband this, we laugh and joke, and we blow it off. And a few more weeks go by, and again, I'm alone. I get out of the shower that morning, head to the bedroom to grab my work clothes, and the bedroom door is all the way closed. We never, ever closed the bedroom door except at night. Maybe I closed it on accident? Maybe one of the dogs had somehow bumped it. It's an old door, and it squeaks every time you open it, and it never stays all the way open because the old hinge is worn out. I looked at this closed door, and I opened it, fully expecting for it to fall into its squeaky, half-open position like it does every single time. But it stands all the way open, rigid as stone. And it stays there as if some force field is holding it. I feel frozen and the AC is not on. The windows and doors are closed and none of the dogs will come near me. And I feel as if something is in the doorway. And now I'm trapped. I have to go to work. My clothes are in the bedroom and something is blocking the doorway. I give myself a pep talk, yell at the invisible thing, push the door open the rest of the way and sprint through it. I told my husband about the incident, but he didn't say anything until after dinner that night. We're at the local Texas Roadhouse. Listen, we've been married a long time. It's okay if you judge us. (laughs) He starts with, did you sleep okay last night? I immediately am suspicious. I said, yes, why? And then he tells me about an experience he had. He wakes up in the middle of the night to a thudding sound he can't quite describe. He opens his eyes to see a face that looks just like his, as if he's looking in a mirror. It's attached to a dark shadow looming above him on the ceiling. I asked him what he did, and he says he shut his eyes and went back (laughs) to sleep. This was two or three in the morning prior to my experience with the door. I was crying tears of fear all over those yummy rolls. We decided we needed to GTFO immediately. We decided that talking about it gave it authority and made it stronger, so we fully ignored it. We also told it to get the fuck out, that it wasn't welcome, and we prayed for protection and for its riddance. In hopes of getting away from it ASAP, we were looking at any possible houses that came on the market. We think it left us at one of these houses. The house was This house was oddly shaped that we went to see, a mid-century modern style. And as soon as we entered, I knew it was not the one, but I kept looking to be polite to our realtor. As I ventured through the house, I noticed items left behind. To me, it looked like that final box of things you would gather and throw into the car just before leaving. They were all suddenly left and forgotten. On the back porch and in the garage, shoes were left for different people of varying sizes. The house had been vacant for over a year, but it was as though the last owners had left in a hurry. And why wait that long to put the house on the market if no one had even been there? On the back patio, there it stood a large golden filigree mirror facing the woods behind the house. In many cultures this far south, a mirror can be placed facing the direction that spirits or evil or bad vibes are coming from, and it reflects it back in that same direction. This is supposed to keep them from crossing the threshold. And that was enough for me. Nope, we've got enough problems. It's time to get out of here. A realtor turned out all the lights in the house just as he had found it, and we were discussing the property with him outside when suddenly a light goes on. Not one, but in two different rooms. And I know what you're thinking. Timers, Alexa, I don't know, someone just messing (laughs) with us? And I wish it were true. This is not that kind of house. This was a 1960s fixer-upper with no updates. Our realtor was so freaked out, he got in his truck and bolted. We stood there in shock, staring at the house. And as we stared at it in disbelief, one of the lights turned off. It was as if we were being taunted. We ran to our car and never looked back. I won't even go to that neighborhood to this day. Our theory is that maybe whatever was in our rental home had come with us to that house and somehow got itself trapped in that mirror. We don't know. We left every mirror that we owned in that rental and we haven't looked back. Cheyenne and Chris. (laughs) Thanks, Cheyenne. And Chris. And Chris. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's true. They sent it in together. (laughs) I I did say Cheyenne and Chris. True, but the story was told from Cheyenne's perspective. 
Well, they sent it together. I'm sure she yeah. did the writing. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. A couple things. First thing, first thing, like um, shithead. What a fun uh, little. That's a great dog name. <laughs> nickname for a dog or full r- real name. I, I feel like there was like a rumor that maybe the singer Pink had a dog named Cunt. Somebody did. I, I don't know why I think it was her, but somebody did. Uh, funny. Yeah, it just made me think about like Penny. She's been like kind of bratty the last couple of days. Oh, shit. Uh huh. I'm like, yeah, I can see like her name transitioning to shithead here and there. We have been calling Gigi. We've just been calling her Fart. Yeah, we called her Fart. Yeah, she had a lot of some bad gas one night. So and she's then, just fart now. She, yeah, she became fart for a little bit. Fart, it's, 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 come here, fart. <laughs> we've kind of funny. we've kind of like weaned off of like trying to get her to recognize fart the last couple of days. But for a while, yeah, we were going hard on just calling her fart and seeing if she respond great. to it. Yeah, and, and she just, she seems like a dog who would just come come she's to the like name okay, of fart. whatever. Yep. And then Penny, she is just oh my gosh, she was so annoying today. We've been trying forever to get her to like stop jumping when you come in the house. She gets so worked up. She's like going to have a heart attack. Uh huh. Like spinning, a lot of spinning. She does all these crazy spins. Partly because she's excited to see you, a lot because she's hoping that in the excitement, you will give her a treat. Exactly. She's the most food-obsessed dog ever. And then, like, you wait, you wait for her to calm down. And I finally waited for her to calm down today. And she seemed so calm. She wasn't, like, vibrating like she will do. And she was just sitting there, totally calm. I give her one pet. And she peed. So much pee. Yeah, because she, she also has, like, that cocker spaniel tendency to pee a lot. Yep. Like, when she's excited. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, you shithead. I get it. Yeah. You shithead. And then... uh the husband's dream. Yeah, that was an interesting Oof. combo with what she saw. Yes. Mm-hmm. You wake up on your back, middle of the night, and you look up, and you are looking back at you. Ugh. And this mofo rolls over and goes back to sleep. I get it, though, because you just want to hope that it's a nightmare. And then if you just close your eyes, you'll you'll just like slip out of that nightmare and into something else. Maybe. Not me. I scream. I'm <laughs> kicking you. I'm yelling at you to wake up. I'm turning on every light. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then, uh, speaking of lights, the two lights going on by themselves at the end of that story. Oh yeah. I was just trying to think if I've ever experienced that because it'll come up a fair amount in like hauntings, you know, lights going on and off by themselves. Yeah. I've been in a place where there's like electrical problems and like a flickering light. That's different. Yeah. But that's different. Yeah, exactly. I've never been in like a place where there's, that just doesn't happen for an extended period of time. Like, you know, lights are in the off position or on, yeah, either way, sure. off or on. And then like that situation where they're standing outside with their realtor, three people looking, and then just two of the lights turn on. And then later one of them turns off. I mean, yes, it could be some kind of wiring thing, but that's weird. I love that the realtor was just like, fuck this. And yeah, I'm just out of here. Le- <laughs> yeah, maybe they're really, uh, <laughs> so really the paranormal. I mean, that was pretty funny. And then, and then that thing... uh the the mirror was it back porch yeah and, and facing away from the house right yeah I, had, I had never heard that I hadn't heard of that either and, but it makes sense to me and, and and if I'm in a house where things are weird and I see that oh yeah then I'm like oh they were dealing with this earlier and this was one of their attempts to try to like protect you, themselves that was not at their rental that was at a house that they were looking at purchasing oh that was not the same house I messed that I messed that up that maybe I was writing something down that was not the same house with the lights going off. It is, but again, that's a right, house that they were looking to purchase, not their rental house. Right, but they thought they brought that thing. That's right. Okay, yeah, that. I was just making sure that you followed yeah. that, yeah. But I would still think if I'm seeing this, that was their speculation that, yeah, yes. we brought something. I would also consider the possibility of like, or there's something else here that the people previously living here were dealing with, trying to deal with and protect themselves by doing that mirror thing. I, I think it's both. I think that there yeah. definitely was something going on in that house because she even says like, or they say yeah. that, you know, that like there were shoes left at this house that's for yeah. sale. There's like box of random things. It feels like the previous owners left in a rush. Yeah. That combined with the mirror. And then after they go, they don't, uh, they, I don't think they come out and say it like explicitly, but it sounds like once they left that house that was for sale, they never had an experience at their rental again. So mm. it's like, they think that whatever that like doppelganger mimic thing that yeah. was bothering them at their rental house must have been attached to Chris comes with them to look at this house yeah. and then they leave it there. <laughs> have, have fun. Enjoy it. Bye. <laughs> well, okay. I thought this was a, like a maybe far-fetched idea, but I thought like, oh my God, what if the, mimicky doppelganger thing actually belongs at the house that's for sale, but it can travel. And it went to this rental house <laughs> and it's showing itself to Chris and Cheyenne. And then it is pushing them- Trying to lure them to the other house? To buy that house. You know how sometimes like we've had stories where people will- they feel drawn to Yes, us. exactly. Yeah. I was like, oh, good job listening to your gut and just getting out of there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that would be a cool story. 
of yeah, like you, like you, they can tell by the end of it mm-hmm. that something is is it's been manipulating them yes. through a series of decisions to to eventually get it to its nest or home. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. God, what was that story? This one maybe really, really early on, and I think you told it. It was like a house sitting story. I'm talking way back in the beginning. And like a young woman house sitting. And by the end, it's like you find out that like her boss was maybe part of like a satanic cult or some sort. Oh, Do you know what I'm talking about? I, 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 and then there's like a, like a, they're like, basically maybe going to like sacrifice her or something. Yes. Golly. Well, if anybody remembers, shoot me an email. Cause that, I, I don't know I think which that's one like it was. Year one. Yeah. But I do remember. Yeah. Year one or year two. That, that is familiar. Yeah. That was mm. so dicey. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Are you ready for a kind of funny, um, little story? And then we'll get into a very dark story. Yeah. The second part of this second story, right? Is the, is the dark two, two separate stories just from the same person. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So, and it'll be obvious. I have two stories to share with you. (laughs) The first one is rather funny about a duende. Duendes are mischievous gnome-like creatures that live in the walls of your house. They're popular in Latin America, Spain, Portugal, and the Philippines. They can range from good to bad, but regardless, they love playing tricks on people. 1994, in the outskirts of Mexico City, my family, consisting of 11 people and I, lived in a four-bedroom house. We grew up knowing the duendes. We are taught not to taunt them or upset them or else they will punish us. They were in, there were instances in which things would go missing or were misplaced, such as car keys put in the oven, the tea kettles in the bathtub, even our shoes appearing on our roof. Regardless of what happened, we were taught to ignore them. My uncle and I were watching The Simpsons one night when the channel kept changing to the local news station. My uncle would change it back, but no matter what he did, the channel would constantly go back to the news on its (laughs) own. My uncle was extremely annoyed and started yelling at the duende, Stop it! You're annoying us! Just out of pure frustration. Being young, I was scared that he had acknowledged them, and even though I was not yelling at them, I was associated with the person who did, so I immediately left the room. (laughs) Later that day, I told my abuelita what had happened. She tried to make my uncle apologize, but he refused, stating he didn't believe in duendes anymore. My uncle and I slept in the living room, where I slept on the couch, and he had a twin mattress on the floor. That night, after we all went to sleep, I was awoken by the TV. It was playing The Simpsons. I turned it off and then climbed back into my bed. As I was falling back asleep, the TV turned on again. I looked to my uncle who was sleeping. I had thought he was maybe trying to scare me. I turned off the TV again, but as I turned around, it turned back on again. And then I heard giggling and the patter of little feet running around the room. I ran to my mom's room and climbed into her bed and instantly fell back asleep. The entire house was awoken by my uncle screaming bloody murder. We found him pressed up against the wall, eyes wide, completely drained of color. He told us someone had been poking his face and giggling. He assumed it was me, but then his blanket was pulled off of him. He sat up to yell at me, but instead he saw two little legs dangling off the couch, just swinging back and forth. There was no way they were my legs. They were much too small. He sat there confused when the duende attacked him. It leapt from the couch onto my uncle's face. He fought it off and then it ran into the wall as the family reached the living room. He described it as having the face of an old man with a wrinkly, with a wrinkly face, a long white beard, big black eyes, and sharp little teeth. My family had a good laugh at him, telling him that that's what he gets for saying what he did and saying he didn't believe in duendes. As an apology, my uncle left some crackers near the wall the duende ran into. It's been 30 years and my uncle will still periodically leave crackers for the duende around the house. If if I actually got attacked by a little old man face gremlin, <laughs> I'm never the same. Like I would I don't ne- know why I, I think it's so <laughs> funny. It's I, so funny to me. I would never feel comfortable like like knowing that that thing was real if that really happened to me. I I, I think I don't think I'd be sane anymore. Like, Probably not. I, I think I'd lose my mind. Our friend Darcy, we had a um a backyard mushroom party at our house one time uh-huh. and oh, remember yeah. she hated the gnome she ah, was yes, so yes. upset about this like really cute white and gold garden uh-huh. that we have she's like it's staring at me so when i was doing I this had to story, go move it i think uh isaac moved it oh yeah yeah not dan moved it oh yeah that's right i was not in a good space to move things no no you were not you thought a lot of us had three eyes i think yeah i thought isaac did yeah yeah it was very interesting <laughs> uh but when i was researching this or te- like working the story into a script, I sent it to her and Darcy was like, no! Nah! 
They're in my walls. I was like, oh, I, just, I like did it to put that idea in her head for the next time. It's like, it's going to be so great. She's going to be so scared. There's gnomes in our walls. Ah, <laughs> uh, creepy. So creepy, but also for some reason, really funny. If you just are like nice to them and don't taunt them, he brought it on himself. Yeah, that would still, that would, that would, ooh, that would, I would not like that. Well, I don't think anybody likes it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Now this, this story is incredibly dark. Okay. I do, I do have to like warn you that the, the ending is quite heavy. If you have young people listening, you might want to check this one out on your own first. My second story is a bit more dark. This all happened to my abuelita when she was a little girl. She has given me her permission to tell her story. In the 1950s, my 10-year-old abuelita lived in a small village in Mexico. She lived with her mom, two younger brothers, her uncle, and his girlfriend. They all grew up extremely Catholic, attending church multiple times a week. One day, her uncle stopped going because he felt so sick during the service and was then plagued by headaches afterwards. His son, he soon became a recluse, locking himself in his bedroom, not eating, not drinking. My abuelita was put in charge of taking care of him. She would bring him food every day and leave it outside his door. And she would hear him arguing with someone on the other side of the door. She recalls him constantly saying, I don't want to do it. My abuelita grew too scared to go near his room. It was like a black hole, she explained. When you were near his door, all the joy and happiness was sucked out of you. Eventually, he started coming out of his room, but he didn't interact with anyone. He would attempt to eat, but then would be immediately sick. His eyes didn't seem to belong to him anymore. My abuelita went to church one evening to speak to her priest. He told her that her uncle was losing a war of his soul and that she needed to help him. I don't know why a grown man would put this on a little girl. She spent her free time with her uncle, talking and praying. Eventually, he confessed to her that something was talking to him every night from his window. It was a dog, but also not a dog. The front part of the body was that of a Zolo dog, with red eyes and two front paws, but had the hind legs of a turkey. It told him to kill, but he resisted. Every night, the creature came back whispering to him to do it, all while laughing. My family banded together, sure that this was the devil's work. They prayed harder. They consulted the church. They asked the village to help. People would camp out in the yard to ensure the creature didn't show up outside the window. However, my uncle claimed it still came every night. The people from the village were one day sharing coffee with my bisabuela, a great grandma, trying to come up with a plan. My abuelita took her uncle a cup of coffee, but as she approached his room, something felt different. She described a feeling of pure evil. She opened the door to find her uncle with a gun in his hands. Mm -hmm. He then shot his girlfriend twice and said he returned and he won and then shot himself in the head. Those in the kitchen came running and everything became blurry. They called the authorities and everyone was rushed outside. And that's when they noticed the prints in the dirt outside his window. They consisted of two dog prints and two turkey tracks, what? as well as some feathers. And here's the kicker. Turkeys are not known to live in the state of Mexico where this took place. No one in the village had even seen any turkeys. The police wrote it off as a mental health issue, and maybe it was, but the prints my family saw they just can't explain that. They ended up calling a curandero, a shaman, to clean the area, cleanse the area, but he explained that the land was spoiled. They ended up demolishing their house and moving to Mexico City after the incident. My abuelita rarely speaks of it, understandably so. All the best, Lena. Thanks, Lena. Ye, uh, so funny how different creatures, well, first of all, yeah, what the hell if this thing was like a some kind of dog turkey? I mean, it made me think of Chupacabra. Oh, uh, I thought like a different version of a skinwalker. Mm, yeah. Yeah, some weird little hybrid thing. Yeah. And, and then just funny how different like um, scenarios hit you differently. Yeah. The first one didn't really bother you, but it bothered me. Like a little, okay, little gremlin with old man face, a million times scarier to me than a dog turkey. I, I was nervous that you were going to hear dog turkey and kind of chuckle a little bit. It does. Yeah, that doesn't bother me. It for doesn't. Some, nope. For some, for some reason, like, I mean, because of how the story ended, I was like, ah, I had this thought before that. But at first I was thinking like, well, I'm going to get a gun and I'm going to shoot that dog turkey. Yeah, yeah. But then obviously like, yeah. Yeah, and I guess I don't know. But if it's a if it's an entity, if it's a spirit, if it's uh, an evil force that no one can see except this guy, I don't know mm-hmm. if you could shoot it. Because no one else claims that they are yeah, seeing it. Try and hit it with a bat or something. But it's outside his window, so that's like also weird. I'd get some curtains. I'd invest in blinds. 
Yeah, but I mean, curtains. it's just like they're living in like, you know, it's like a very different kind of. I tape a pillow to that something. I'm like, if dog, if dog turkey keeps showing up every night. Yeah. I'm like, I, but it, it does sound like window. they did try everything. You know, yeah. it's just like, I mean, again, this is like told from like her grandmother who. Totally. Just based on Lena's language in this. English is not her first sure, language sure. and then very certainly not her grandmother's first language. So maybe it's not all completely. What they should have done is put a cage outside the window <laughs> and then inside the cage, dog treats and whatever turkey's like. Oh boy. And see if the combination would entice the dog turkey to go into the cage. I don't think so, buddy. <laughs> I think what you're missing is that. It's... Oh, I know. I know. No, I do get the story. I know. Yeah. It, but, but that's what I'm saying. It is it's just funny how like certain animal hybrids. I mean, yeah. if I actually saw a paranormal dog turkey, I'm sure it would scare the shit out of me. Exactly. But then if but then if there was a little gremlin with old man face that suddenly jumped up on top of that dog turkey, <laughs> now my fear is exponential. Like if he's riding like a horse, now I just die of fright. Uh what was the the rooster, the chicken outside the window? <laughs> that story. <laughs> Yeah, that one, that one didn't scare me. That, that one was just, I couldn't take it. I, I, yeah, I hate being that person. Like, like I feel like the dickhead in a horror movie. You are. Who's laughing. You are. But like, it was like a possessed chicken. I'm like, I can't, I can't get into it. Yeah. Because there's like, there's a kind of like a subgenre of like B horror movies mm -hmm. where they will have like weird creatures like that. Uh, that just are not inherently scary or more like silly. Yeah. I don't know. To read more silly. For me, I think it's like, maybe it's my Catholic upbringing that like this story like freaked me the fuck out yeah so i'm like oh great they like went to the priest they did all the yeah. things the village is all praying everyone's praying everyone's trying they're doing all the things like the the village is camped out outside of his window trying to keep the dog turkey from like coming <laughs> right yeah trying to keep like this entity yeah. from getting to him yeah and it's like yeah i i don't know i just i don't like yeah it. and like took over him in such a forceful way that he shoots and kills himself and i don't know if the girlfriend yeah, so died but like shot somebody i mean that's that's awful. so sad so tragic yeah and to be like unable to manage that yeah uh, yeah. yeah i don't know i don't like it my brain also went and this has nothing to do with the story but with Gigi. uh-huh we talk about how she has like little rabbit legs or turkey legs yeah and so then i was also which is not adding to the horror yeah. i was just picturing ginger bell yeah with the back half of her body shaved down to the skin and she would look like a dog turkey. She would look like a dog she has, turkey. She has these skinny little turkey legs in the back. Yeah. Okay. But no, that's that. Those are, yeah, those are some wild stories. Yeah. That's it. I'm, I'm hoping I don't think about that um, old man, grim, old man face gremlin. I'm going to bring him up a lot. Blah. I hate that combination. I would rather see Funny. a scary old man or a scary little gremlin by far. I'd rather see both of those things together. I'd rather see a scary old man. Oh, they're like a little ho team? Holding a scary little gremlin. Okay. Like a like a ventriloquist dummy, then <laughs> then to see a scary gremlin with an old man face. I don't like that at all. Well, I think that like gnomes already have like old man faces. Yeah, I guess they do. So I just like doesn't feel like that far of a. I don't know. Maybe that's why I think but they it's, have like, a so silly, silly little hat. They have a silly little hat that deflects from the terror. You don't know whether or not this guy's wearing a hat. They didn't disclose. Yeah. Maybe not... maybe he was wearing a long stocking cap. Okay, then that would that would tamper it down a little bit. But if he's biting my face, he's attacking my face. Ugh. Po nope, I don't like. I, I, I don't think like. He was just poking the face and just laughing, like ha 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 ha. Okay, well, that's silly. That, that that's not as if he's biting. That's way more scary. Was he biting? I thought he was biting. Okay, you do the first round of shoutouts, and I'm gonna look and see if he was biting. Okay, uh, I'd like to thank the following Annabelles for supporting us here at Scared to Death. Very appreciated. Uh, Connor Smith, uh, Derek Burge, Danny G, Laura Oberbickler, Zoella Divine. Kara or Kara, probably Dowdle, Free, but P H R E E, and Cat Motherfucking Jones. Cat Love it. Motherfucking Jones. Uh, the Duende was just poking his face and laughing. Oh, okay. I, I added the biting. Okay. Well, that's okay. Uh, I would like to thank the following Annabelle's. Uh, don't forget to apply for the scholarship if that's in your wheelhouse. All made possible by our supporters here. Thank you to Vic, Tanner Reed, uh, Rubama. Nasir, Kathy Kramer, Anita Ford, Jetty Phillips, Michael Evans, and Pixie Blue. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And then I have some spoopy shout out. Get some spoops in. To Kristen from Kristen. Happy 30th fucking birthday to myself. Rest in peace, 20s. 
I hope I'm tearing it up in NOLA as our queen of the spoops reads this. Okay, go get yourself some purple drink. Only one. That is the <laughs> rule. You can only have one a day. <laughs> to Angel Man from L. I'm so excited for this new adventure moving to Australia on our anniversary. Oh, I love you lots. Wow. Go find a Cleo Harper. They have the best workout gear. Oh, you will, yeah, you, you will, do love that. Oh, I love it so much. And to Cassie from your daughter, Carrie, you made me who I am, mom. You're the best mom anyone could ever ask for. I love you. So sweet. <laughs> Uh, and that is our show, you Pune dog turkeys. Uh, thanks for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. You can email us for everything else, info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Thank you to Logan Keith, editing and publishing today's show. Thank you to Heather Rylander, organizing the My Story emails, to book editor Drew Atana, polishing and preparing listener stories for book number five. Thank you to Olivia Lee for finding the first story I told this week, and to Sarah Finch for finding the second. We're on YouTube if you want to watch us. We're on Facebook and Instagram where we have pics that accompany episodes and more at Scared to Death Podcast. Also have a private Facebook group, Creeps and Peepers, full of fellow horror lovers and just some really good folks. Yeah. Uh, big thanks to the All Seen Eyes, the Creeps and Peepers moderators. Speaking of fine folks, mm -hmm. you are all fantastic. Uh, enjoy your nightmares, Creeps and Peepers, and hope you were scared to death. Bye. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through but have no home here within scared to death. Bad Magic Productions. Sweet, sweet Pune. During the early- They don't appreciate that. Who doesn't? The people of Pune. Oh, they don't? No. Uh, do we have a strong listener base in Pune? We do. I bet they do appreciate it.